Los Angeles has long been known as a place where dreams are both made and broken. For every story of glittering success on the silver screen, countless others end in disappointment. With aspirations unfulfilled, talents overlooked, or opportunities never presented. Hollywood, especially during the iconic era of film noir in the 1940s, is steeped in tales of sorrow and marked by loss. This period in Hollywood and across LA was carried characterized by widespread crime and a pervasive sense of lawlessness, often exasperated by a police force criticized for its inefficiency or reluctance to address the rampant violence that claimed numerous lives, including those of many women. The aftermath of World War II saw the streets of LA awash with surplus weapons and illusioned veterans, alongside a motley crew of pimps, mobsters, and those adept at navigating the murky waters of corruption. This period was marked by the dominance of the criminal underworld, casting a shadow over the city. However, it wasn't all-encompassing darkness. Many people in LA led unaffected lives amidst the chaos. Some found the very success others only dreamt of. Among these fortunate few was Jean Spangler, a 26-year-old actress beginning to make her mark alongside stars like Kurt Douglas and Betty Grable. Yet, in October in October of 1949, Spangler's promising journey took a mysterious turn when she disappeared without a trace, leaving behind a trail of speculation involving high-profile names and the grim realities of illegal abortions. Her case remains one of Hollywood's most perplexing unsolved mysteries. Jean Spangler's early life set the stage for her later pursuits in the bustling city of LA. Born on September 2nd, 1923, in Seattle, Washington, her family later relocated to LA, where she attended Benjamin Franklin High School, located merely seven miles from downtown. During her teenage years, Jean showcased her talent as a dancer at notable venues such as Earl Carroll Theatre and Florentine Gardens, the latter of which would also be associated with Elizabeth Short famously known as the Black Dahlia. In 1942, Jean's personal life took a significant turn when she married Dexter Benner. The couple welcomed a daughter, Christine, in 1944. However, the union was fraught with unhappiness, leading to a divorce in 1946 amidst allegations of cruelty from Jean towards Dexter. The custody battle that ensued was bitter, Benner initially gaining temporary custody of Christine and accusing Jean of prioritizing her social life over her responsibilities as a mother. He went so far as to deny Jean access to their daughter on numerous occasions and allegedly threatened to ensure she would never see her daughter again. Despite these challenges, Jean emerged victorious in 1948, securing custody of Christine after a lengthy and arduous legal battle. In 1948, the same year, Jean Spangler regained custody of her daughter. She embarked on her journey in the film industry with a debut role as an ex in The Miracle of the Bells, an RKO production featuring Frederick McMurray, this initial appearance marked the beginning of her burgeoning career in Hollywood. As she continued to secure roles as an extra in various films, she graced the screen in productions such as When My Baby Smiles at Me and Chicken Every Sunday, slowly making her presence known in the industry. Spangler's career trajectory took a notable upturn when she participated in Young Man with a Horn sharing a scene with the acclaimed Kirk Douglas. This film, which also starred Lauren Bacall, Doris Day, and Hoagie Carmichael, showcased an ensemble of talent that placed Spangler in the company of Hollywood's elite. Following this, she was involved in the filming of The Petty Girl, a project that began shooting on September 6, 1949, and featured Robert Cummings and Joan Caulfield. Spangler's interaction with Cummings was notably positive, with the two sharing pleasant exchanges on set. Despite her career thus far, considering of smaller roles, Jean Spangler's recent acquisition of a new agent signaled a promising future in the entertainment industry. With her talent and determination, she was poised for greater opportunities, suggesting that her potential in Hollywood was just beginning to unfold. During a pivotal moment in her life, Jean Spangler was living with her daughter, Christine, and her mother, Florence, in LA. The family was joined by Sophie, 
Jean's sister-in-law, whose husband, Jean's brother, had tragically died in the war. Their residence was in the expansive Parc La Bray complex near Wilshire Boulevard, a notable and vast housing development in the country, providing a backdrop to the lives filled with both promise and routine. On the evening of October 7th, 1949, Jean prepared to leave her home under circumstances that seemed ordinary, yet were tinged with the residue of past conflicts. It was approximately 5.30 p.m. when she informed her family that she was going to meet her ex-husband, Dexter Benner. Their purpose of their meeting was to discuss overdue child support payments, a matter complicated by their messy divorce and the subsequent custody battle over their daughter. After entrusting her daughter to the care of Sophie, with her mother away from the city, Jean set out indicating that she planned to attend a night shoot for a new film project later that evening. Remarkably, Jean made a phone call home about two hours hours after her departure, informing her sister-in-law and speaking to her daughter as well, stating that she would be occupied all night due to the film shoot lasting a full eight hours. This conversation would become the final confirmed communication from Jean, leaving a haunting silence in its wake. When she did not return home the following day, concern escalated rapidly. Sophie, acting on a growing sense of alarm, reached out to the police to report Jean missing, setting in motion a mystery that would captivate and perplex many for years to come. The investigation into Jean Spangler's disappearance swiftly moved to ascertain her whereabouts on the night she vanished. The initial focus was on verifying her claim of attending a night shoot for a film. However, the situation took a concerning turn when it was discovered that there was no record of her working on any film set in LA that night. Both film studios and the Screen Extras Guild confirmed that there were no shoots she could have been a part of. Casting and out on the reasons for her leaving home and raising fears of foul play. Further inquiries into Dexter Benner, Jean's ex-husband, revealed that he denied any planned meeting with Jean on the evening of her disappearance. He asserted that he had not seen her for several weeks, claiming he spent the entire evening at home with his new wife, Lynn, who was his alibi. The investigation then led to a breakthrough with a witness claiming to have seen Spangler at the farmer's market close to her residence at around 6 p.m. on October 7th. According to the witness, a store clerk, Jean seemed to be waiting for someone, suggesting that the possibility that she had arranged to meet someone at the market, possibly to avoid being seen near her home. The witness's account indicated that Jean had waited there for approximately two hours, during which she likely made the phone call to her family, informing them that she would not return home that night. This sighting provided a critical, yet puzzling, piece of the timeline in the hours leading up to her unexplained disappearance. As the investigation into Jean Spangler's disappearance unfolded, various reports of sightings added layers of complexity and intrigue. Among these were the claims of her being spotted around 10 p.m. on Vine Street, enjoying hot dogs with a man described as clean cut, initially believed to be a sighting of Jean in good spirits and seemingly without worry on the night of her disappearance. Those witnesses later recanted under police scrutiny, suggesting that they had mistaken the date and actually seen her on October 6, not October 7th. However, the narrative of Jean being seen with a clean-cut man persisted, with other witnesses alleging to have seen her at the Cheesebox restaurant at around 1.30 a.m. on October 8th. This sighting suggested that Jean was not only out much later than last confirmed sighting at the farmer's market, but also in the company of an unidentified man. Adding to this, Al Lazar, a well-known DJ on the Sunset Strip, claimed to have witnessed Jean arguing with two men at the establishment around 2.30 a.m., further deepening the mystery of her last known movements. Terry Taylor, the owner of Cheesebox, corroborated that the presence of Jean and the clean-cut individual, a detail echoed by a newsboy. These accounts collectively painted a picture of Jean's final hours being fraught with social interactions, including a potential confrontation, starkly contrasting the initial belief that she might have simply vanished after a supposed film shoot. The discrepancies and revelations from these witnesses fueled speculation and suggested a complex web of events leading up to her disappearance. 
Two days after Jean Spangler's disappearance, a significant discovery was made when her purse was found in Griffith Park, situated about five and a half miles from her home. The torn strap on the purse suggested a violent attempt to snatch it, prompting police to thoroughly search the park for any additional evidence. Despite their efforts, no further clues emerged from the search. The finding of Spangler's purse in such circumstances fueled speculation and concern. There was a rampant speculation in the LA press about a potential serial killer, a theory that was largely unsubstantiated but drew connections to various unsolved slayings of young, brunette, attractive women over the previous decade, including the infamous case of Elizabeth Short known as the Black Dahlia. This speculation placed Jean Spangler within a pattern of victims that the press hypothesized, yet without any solid evidence. The police, while publicly focusing on the search for Spangler, privately considered connections to other missing persons, including Minnie Boomhauer, a widowed socialite who had vanished that August. The contents of Spangler's purse offered a tantalizing yet puzzling clue, a note addressed to Kirk, mentioning a plan to see a Dr. Scott. The note's abrupt ending with a comma suggested it was unfinished, leaving its full intent and the identities of Kirk and Dr. Scott shrouded in mystery. The note read, Kirk, can't wait any longer going to see Dr. Scott. It will work best this way while mother is away. The cryptic message opened a myriad of questions regarding its context, the individuals involved, and its connection to Spangler's disappearance, deepening the mystery of the case. The mysterious note found in Jean Spangler's purse addressed to a Kirk intensified the intrigue surrounding her disappearance. Initially, no one in Spangler's immediate family could identify anyone by the name Kirk or Dr. Scott. This changed upon the return of Jean's mother, Florence, who recalled that a man named Kirk picked Jean up at their home on two occasions waiting for her in his car outside. The connection to a Kirk became more compelling when considering Jean Spangler's recent work. She had completed filming for Young Man with a Horn, a musical drama directed by Michael Curtis in which she shared a scene with Kirk Douglas one of Hollywood's leading actors at the time. Despite extensive investigation, police could not link Jean to any other individual named Kirk. I had a feeling she was pregnant with his baby. Kirk Douglas, upon a learning of the note and its publication in the press, proactively reached out to the police to clear his name from the investigation. His initial denial of knowing Spangler raised questions, especially since his subsequent admission during a thorough telephone interview. Douglas clarified that while he had had interacted with Spangler on the set of Young Man with a Horn, their interactions were limited to casual conversation and jesting. He firmly stated that he had never met her outside of these professional circumstances and provided an alibi that placed him in Palm Springs on the night of Jean's disappearance. This development left the authorities and the public pondering the true nature of Jean's relationship with Kirk and the identity and relevance of Dr. Scott mentioned in her note. Douglas's voluntary communication with the police reflected the high-profile nature of the case and the urgency to solve the mystery of Jean Spangler's disappearance. Following the discovery of Jean Spangler's cryptic note addressed to Kirk, speculation and investigation rapidly focused on identifying this individual. The mention of Kirk Douglas in the context of her recent work on the film Young Man with a Horn led to initial suspicions directed towards the Hollywood star. Douglas's proactive approach in contacting the police to clear his name coupled with his statement that he only had a casual interaction with Spangler on the set helped shift the focus of the investigation away from him. Douglas's press statement on October 12, 1949 clarified his limited interaction with Spangler, emphasizing that his acquaintance with her was brief and professional, limited to their time on the set. He described her as a tall girl in a green dress whom he had conversed and joked, but he affirmed that their interaction did not extend beyond the professional environment, and he was in Palm Springs at the time of her disappearance. With Douglas effectively ruled out of the investigation, the police and Spangler's family continued to search for the real Kirk. Friends of Spangler hinted at a secret affair with actor Robert Cummings, revealing that Jean had mentioned being in a casual relationship, though she did not disclose the man's name. This lead pointed investigators in a new direction, eventually identifying a writer named Peter Brooks 
who was briefly considered in relation to the case, but found to have no significant connection to Spangler's disappearance. The ongoing investigation into the elusive Kirk and the circumstances surrounding Jean Spangler's disappearance remain fraught with unanswered questions and dead ends, leaving her fate and the identity of the individuals mentioned in her final note as enduring mysteries. The investigation into Jean Spangler's disappearance took a significant turn when a friend disclosed that Jean might have been pregnant and considering having the pregnancy terminated, a revelation that introduced a new layer of complexity to the case. Given the societal norms and legal constraints of the time, the subject of pregnancy outside of marriage and terminating a pregnancy was cloaked in secrecy and stigma, making it difficult to ascertain the truth of such claims. The police considered the possibility that Jean's stated plans on the night she vanished could have been a cover for seeking an illegal abortion, a practice fraught with risk and danger in 1949. This theory brought the mysterious Dr. Scott mentioned the note found in Jean's purse into sharper focus. Police speculated that the note was intended for Kirk, informing him of her decision to proceed with terminating the pregnancy during her mother's absence. The investigation expanded to include all medical practitioners named Scott within LA. Though none acknowledged knowing Spangler, given the illegal status of terminating a pregnancy at the time, it was unlikely that any involved party would openly admit to such an association, especially if the procedure had resulted in tragic consequences. The alias Dr. Scott could have been a nickname used to protect the identity of a person involved in an illegal abortion network, which often included not only doctors, but also medical students, nurses, and others with medical knowledge willing to perform these risky procedures under the radar. The lack of willingness among medical professionals to jeopardize their careers and liberty for such activities meant that those who did not offer such services operated in a shadowy world far removed from legal and medical oversight. The hypothesis that Jean Spangler might have been seeking to terminate her pregnancy added a deeply personal and tragic dimension to her disappearance, highlighting the dangers faced by women in an era when their choices were severely limited by law and societal judgment. This line of inquiry while speculative underscored the lengths to which individuals might go to conceal their actions and the profound risks associated with illegal pregnancy termination during this time period. The mystery of Jean Spangler's disappearance and the discovery of her purse in Griffith Park raised more questions than answers, leading to the formulation of various theories by those dissatisfied with her botched termination of a pregnancy hypothesis. One such theory dived into the darker aspects of Hollywood Hollywood's underbelly, drawing a tentative connection between Spangler and the infamous Black Dahlia slaying. Partly because of her past employment at the Florentine Gardens nightclub, owned by Danish businessman Mark Hansen, Florentine Gardens was a popular spot in Hollywood, attracting a diverse crowd that included Hollywood celebrities and allegedly figures from the criminal underworld like gangster Mickey Cohen. It was rumored that Hansen, who sometimes offered lodging to women working for him, made un wanted sexual advances towards them, including Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, whose gruesome slaying in 1947 shocked LA and is still unsolved. This speculation was fueled by Spangler's historical link to Florentine Gardens, where she danced during her teenage years. However, there was no direct evidence to suggest Hansen was violent or involved in any criminal activities related to the deaths of Elizabeth Short or Jean Spangler. The connection to the nightclub club and its alleged ties to organized crime painted a picture of a potentially dangerous environment. But these theories remain speculative without concrete evidence to support any direct involvement of Hansen or the nightclub in Spangler's disappearance. The discovery of Spangler's purse with the mysterious note inside in Griffith Park seemed incongruent with the notion of a simple case of botched pregnancy termination. This discrepancy led to the exploration of the alternative scenarios, including the potential link to Hollywood's more sinister elements. Yet without definitive proof, these theories added layers of intrigue and complexity to the already baffling case of Jean Spangler, leaving her fate enveloped in mystery. The investigation into Jean Spangler's disappearance explored various leads, one of which involved a man referred to as only as Doc, rumored to frequent the same social circles as Spangler, and allegedly willing to form the termination of pregnancies at no cost. 
This lead intrigued investigators who speculated whether Doc might be the Dr. Scott mentioned in Spangler's mysterious note. And while some attempted to connect this figure to Dr. George Hodo, a suspect in the Black Dahlia case, Doc was described as an ex-medical student from a wealthy family, distinct from Hodo's profile. Adding another layer to the mystery, Davy Ogle, an associate of notorious gangster Mickey Cohen, disappeared just two days after Spangler, coinciding with the discovery of her purse in Griffith Park. Rumors suggested Ogle might have been another secret lover of Spangler, leading to speculation that the pair could have either eloped or met a tragic fate together. Eyewitness accounts reportedly placed Spangler and Ogle in Palm Springs and Las Vegas, often in the company of Frank Nicoli, another Cohen associate who had also disappeared around the same time. Ogle's disappearance followed his indictment for conspiracy, fueling theories that he and Spangler fled to evade legal repercussions and potential conviction. In 1950, a customs agent in El Paso, Texas claimed to have seen Spangler and Ogle at a hotel, identifying Spangler from a photograph provided by police. Despite this sighting, Jean's mother, Florence Spangler, dismissed the possibility of her daughter being alive and voluntarily out of contact. She firmly believed that if Jean were free, she would have reached out to her family, particularly to her beloved daughter. Florence's statement underscored the desperation and hopelessness felt by the family in the face of Jean's unexplained disappearance, rejecting the notion that Jean would abandon her daughter without any dire coercion. Jean Spangler's disappearance remains one of Hollywood's most enduring mysteries, encapsulating a tragic story that has baffled investigators, family members, and the public for decades. The myriad of possibilities regarding her fate highlight the complexities and dangers of the time as well as the challenges faced by women in an era when options were severely limited. The subsequent custody battle over Christine, Jean's daughter, and the various sightings reported across California, Arizona, and Mexico City add layers of intrigue and heartache to an already complicated case. Despite the numerous theories ranging from a tragic end to an illegal pregnancy termination, falling victim to a serial killer, involvement with the LA underworld, or even a, a deliberate disappearance to start a new life, no conclusive evidence has emerged to solve the mystery of her fate. The involvement of figures like Doc, possibly linked to illegal terminations of pregnancies and the connections to the criminal underworld through individuals like Davy Ogle suggest a web of potential scenarios that Jean may have been intended angled in. Yet, without definitive proof or reliable eyewitness accounts, these theories remain speculative. Jean Spangler's case is a poignant reminder of the countless missing persons whose stories were left unsolved, leaving families and fan friends in a perpetual state of uncertainty and loss. It underscores the challenges faced by law enforcement in solving such cases, especially when they didn't have a lot of forensic science back then. Unless new evidence is discovered or long-lost information comes out, the disappearance appearance of Jean Spangler will likely continue to be unsolved and will be a mystery in the golden age of Hollywood that reflects the darker undercurrents of a bygone era. And that's so weird that they're just unsolved and they didn't find her body. I find that creepy. I feel like it has something to do with Kirk Douglas. I don't know why. It just does. The name Kirk, the note, the movie together. I don't know. Let me know in the comments below. What do you think? Also, let me know if you have any other video requests. And if you're interested in the Black Dahlia, I have another video that I did on the Black Dahlia right here. All right. See you guys again soon. Bye.